Yeah, boy, look at that bundle of tines. And you're, what are you looking for? What are you doing right there? Uh, I'm, that's where I'm notching the tine. As I told you, I was notching it so I could get the bolt cutter over it. And you say there's one of them there. that. that there is that one way? in both situations that I have been into. A year ago, we showed one of the most fascinating tapes we've ever seen on Michigan Outdoors. Dr. Asa Kelly, a veterinarian from Addison, was called in by a conservation officer to try to separate two bucks that had their antlers locked. Doc Kelly's wife, Marlene, grabbed the home video camera and documented the whole process. To free the bucks, Doc Kelly snipped off one of the buck's tines. Now, we knew that buck would be recognized if those antlers showed up on a buck pole or along a highway. Both sets of antlers did show up, and now, a year later, Doc Kelly continues the story. The ditch that the deer was in was kind of a V-shaped ditch right beside the road, and he said it looked like the car had hit the deer, flipped him, and he lit on his back in there. And this was roughly three weeks to a month later, so it was, you know, nothing to do with him being emaciated, debilitated, or any of those conditions. So this was a month after you, roughly, would, you had cut that tine right the there. That's the one that we took off to release those two. And the amazing thing is, this was the buck who was released. That is the other one. Now, as I recall, which one was the winner? Uh, this one thought he this was. This one thought he <laughs> yeah. was the winner. It, I, I agreed with him. I thought he was, too. And he had stood his ground, and yeah. he had driven this one away. Yeah. And this one yeah. was taken by Jerry. Yeah. Bow hunting. Uh, a, a deer that makes this one made the record book, mm -hmm. commemorative mm -hmm. books, mm -hmm. in the archery category. Mm -hmm. What was your story behind this? Well, it was about 7.30 in the morning. He come through. There was uh, a doe and another buck with him. And uh, the doe went a different way. And a six point come by me, I passed him up and he come by. And all I could see is the antler sticking up there and, uh, and he come in about 20 yards and shot him. And you took him. Yeah. How far away was this deer from where you released the two? It was about half a mile, three quarters of a mile from. And how about that one when it was hit About by the, the same way, the other way. Not too far away no, though? No, they were, they were centered. Oh, darn. And uh, Jerry came up and told me he thought he had the deer. Mm -hmm. And we took pictures of it and looked at both antlers and so on. If you notice at the back of his ear here, you can see where he had been, oh, been hooked together. That? Oh, that uh, was a, a yeah. wound from being hooked? Uh, that's, uh, I remember that when I was working with him. That's oh. why I told him if his right ear had an abrasion on it, the chances are pretty good that was it. And then as we got to looking, I, there's no doubt in my mind but what these are the two deer. I'll be darned. So this rack here... You're going to let us borrow from this the is museum? Yours. Super. We'll put this. that up at the museum, and maybe sometime we can talk Jerry into loan on this. This one for a couple I, I, months. It wouldn't surprise it me. <laughs> That'd be great. What a story. What a That's story. It. Following this, what are you going to have next for us, Doc? I'll let you know a little later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Whatever it is, it'll be interesting. Congratulations, <laughs> Jerry. Thanks an awful lot. The crowd in the Michigan Outdoors cabin loved hearing the rest of the story from Doc Kelly and young bow hunter Jerry Wilson from Clayton. By the way, Jerry's buck made the commemorative buck's record book. The highway killed buck would have, except for the time that Doc Kelly snipped off. That put the score just below the minimum. The video of the release of the two bucks, along with the antlers from the winner, will be on display at the museum in Houghton Lake starting this weekend. Jerry said we can put the other buck on display sometime next year. But what causes big antlers in deer? How much does food have to do with it? At the Houghton Lake Deer Research Station, antler and nutrition studies are done with the help of one of the world's top antler specialists, Dr. Dwayne Olray from Michigan State University. I asked him if a good food supply is the key to big antlers. There might be some difference in the in the mass of nature of the antlers, um, but it isn't quite the same as accumulating fat in the case of a short person who can't grow any taller. Uh, I think it's, I think there probably is a difference in mass of antlers associated with nutrient supply, but it's a pretty limited change. I'd like to put it a different way, and that is that genetics is gonna limit the dimensions, whatever they might be, and if food supply is short, chances are the development of the antler is going to be deficient. From my discussion with Dr. Olray, it was plain that genetics is the controlling factor that decides the overall shape and size of a buck's antlers. 
poor nutrition can limit the size and cause them to be smaller, but extra food can't make the antlers bigger than the family genetics allow. Big antlers don't necessarily mean the buck is smarter or better than other deer, but a big antlered buck will be dominant when it comes to breeding. But what about the question of big antlers and good meat? Is a rocking chair buck a better animal for the table? I would find it difficult to relate uh, antler size and shape to the way a deer tastes. Uh, you do hear these uh, stories about the swamp bucks, and uh, those tend to be big and massive and have great antlers. Uh, personally, I think uh, better eating might be a yearling from some farm south of Williamston. You might know that farm, huh? <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> I might. <laughs> Well, I gotta confess, I'm a meat hunter and not a trophy hunter. Not that I wouldn't like a trophy, but I do enjoy the venison and it takes a certain amount of luck to even see a record book buck. But what if you do luck into a big one? Well, this is the group of fellows you want to take that monster buck to. They're some of the leadership in commemorative bucks of Michigan. Dan LaRose is their president and this year he's proud of that legislative resolution that makes CBM the official big buck record keepers in Michigan. Well, there's several groups out there that are measuring, and I think it's getting confusing to some of the hunters. Where do they take their deer to get scored and, and to get measured? And if they want to get it in a record book, where do they go? So we've been working with the DNR for the eight years that we've been in existence. This year, uh, thanks to Senator Barcia, Senator Gast, they put a resolution, a joint resolution through the House, and uh, they recognize commemorative bucks of Michigan as the official record keepers. So now our buck facts, it comes out four times a year, and our record books will be the official records for the state of Michigan. Well, as I understand it, to get scored Boone and Crockett cost some money. I say as I understand it, I don't, I've never had any occasion to use the scoring service, <laughs> if you know what I mean. But you do have to pay to get it in the national and international record books, right? Well, it doesn't cost anything to, to get it measured. I mean, there's three Boone and Crockett measures here tonight. But to enter into the National Boone and Crockett book costs $25. What, what CBM has said now, if you're a member of CBM, prior to taking an animal that makes Boone and Crockett, we'll pay the $25 entry fee. Hmm. We'll do the same thing for Pope and Young and for the new muzzle loaders. Are you scoring more than deer? We're scoring the, uh, the bear and the elk taken in Michigan. We as Boone and Crockett scorers can score any animal taken in North America, in any state. But for Michigan, it's deer, bear, and elk. Record book scoring isn't easy. It takes several trained people. On a typical whitetail buck, for example, the lengths of both main beams are measured with a wire cable that's taped several places on the beam for alignment, an alligator clip goes square across the tip of the beam for accuracy, and the cable is then measured to the exact length. The length of both beams are added together, then the difference between them is subtracted. Added then is either the inside spread or the length of the longest main beam, whichever is less. Then the tines are marked and measured individually, added to the score, with the differences in matching tines subtracted. Now, if a point is abnormal and doesn't match a tine on a corresponding beam, it's subtracted unless the abnormal points total more than 12 and a half inches, which means the rack will be scored as non-typical and get credit for those abnormal tines. Other measurements are taken, such as the tip-to-tip -tip beam spread and the outside spread. Now, these don't figure into the actual scoring for the Pope and Young or Boone and Crockett totals. They're called miscellaneous data. But this next set of measurements does figure in. Now these are taken very carefully. They're the circumferences measured between the tines of each beam in four places, that's eight numbers in all. Corresponding differences are subtracted, and it takes a good 15 minutes to score a rack this way. After all the mathematics are done, there's your score as recognized internationally. Now for our Stroh's Hunting Awards. We use a simplified scoring system. Any 10-point buck qualifies, and an antler point is basically one that is an inch or longer. Or if the antler points plus the maximum outside spread in inches are at least 28, you'll qualify. 
And as a qualifier, you'll receive a year's membership in the Outdoors Club, including the Outdoor Digest magazine, an embroidered patch, a signed certificate, a listing in the annual trophy book, which is a part of our Fish and Wild Game Classics Recipe book, and you'll be invited to be recognized on stage during our February Hunting Awards Banquet, where winners are all taped for possible use on TV later in the year. But this is Big Buck Night, and the biggest bucks we could find from the 1988 season are here. So let's start with the ladies in the bow hunting category. Bob? Well, Fred, here's a young woman who recently became Harry Reinfelder's daughter-in-law, Joan Reinfelder from Pickford. On Thanksgiving Day, she took this 10-point buck by herself up in Chippewa County. Was your husband with you at the time? Oh, no. Wasn't? He was at home watching my son. <laughs> Well, that's pretty good. What, do you do tag team on that, watching your son? <laughs> no. <laughs> we just come home for Thanksgiving dinner. And I had quit that afternoon. I'd quit gone hunting. <laughs> I says, no more. I'm tired of getting cold. <laughs> and um, my mother told me, she says, but it's real fun. Just go on out and hunt. My mother hunts, too. And um, we got home, and I asked him, I says, it was only about another hour left of dark, before, until dark. And I asked him, I says, are you going to go out hunting or not? And he says, no. He says, I think I'll have a little nap. And I says, well, you can take care of Shane, then I'll go out hunting. <laughs> so I went out, and about 45 minutes later, I shot this one. Oh, that's great. What did you do? Did you, uh, did you field dress it yourself? Heavens, no. <laughs> <laughs> go back and call I him mean, back? Oh, my God, my husband. <laughs> Okay, well, that's a, a great story from Joan Reinfelder. Her Thanksgiving Day buck from the eastern end of the Upper Peninsula. Diane McFall from Traverse City got a beautiful 10-pointer bow hunting in October. Now, the interesting thing is, is that she missed a doe a little earlier, but maintained her composure for a perfect shot. I would think that you would have more buck fever with this one than with the Not doe. really, because what I did, I looked at the horns and I thought, look at the deer itself. Don't look at the horns. Where did you learn that? I took a good lesson from my husband. Ah. And reading the magazines and that stuff. Did you, do you have a sight on your bow? Uh-huh. So you could just bear right down and concentrate? I had three pins, 10 yard, and 20 yard, and a 30 yard pin. What I had done, I used the 20 yard pin on the doe and I missed. So when this buck came in the same area as the doe, I used the 30 yard pin I was right on. Great. Was it 30 yards away? It was about 26. Ah. Some of the most exciting buck stories don't involve huge racks. Eric Banner from Lansing has a whale of a story about this eight point he retrieved across a drainage ditch. So I went after it and I went through water up to my chest and I finally caught up to the deer and it was going up the bank. And I said, click, and there's no more shells. I said, oh man. So I crossed the creek to go after it. And when I got up on the other side of the bank, it charged me. And when it came at me, I dropped my gun and grabbed the horns, and we both went in the water. And I ended up drowning it. <laughs> <laughs> so you had this buck coming towards you with its tides. Did, it, did it have its head down? Yeah, it scared the hell out of me. <laughs> well, well, I guess. How, it was on the bank, so was it coming very fast? Yeah, it took about 10 steps at me. And I, I had enough sense to drop my gun. I just grabbed it by its horns. I grabbed it kind of like this. So you had it by the antlers. Yeah. And, and, and it was, was it still trying to charge you? Was it, what yeah. happens when you get a deer like well, that? Well, when he came at me, the momentum that he had, we just both went in the water. I kind of went in backwards. And Boy, I, was it lucky that you, you know if you would have missed with your hand? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I told my wife, I said, that would have hurt. I guess. <laughs> you know? So you, you really made a lucky grab onto that. Yeah, I measured the tongs. They're about four inches. Oh. I couldn't imagine four inches of horn going into me at all. Oh. But you came close to it. Yeah. Yep, it took me. I held them underwater for about five minutes. But I bet you had to. <laughs> your head must have been spinning when you were done with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a close encounter of the most dangerous kind for Eric Banner. We have another hair-raising attack with an even larger whitetail buck coming up in just a few minutes when Big Buck Night 1988 continues. <laughs> 